I'd like to talk about your role in the Nixon administration. You worked in the Nixon White House, part of his staff. What was your role in the Nixon administration? Well, uh, I was awarded a White House fellowship in 1969, uh, two weeks after graduating from Harvard Law School. So the program started in September. Uh, It was a year's uh, paid study of the executive branch. And and I was single and enthusiastic and and, uh, uh, had no other responsibilities and had an absolute ball. I was uh, uh, assigned the Department of Treasury uh, but the program, it's usually 15, 16 people each year that, that come to Washington on this program. Uh, uh, you get to meet with almost everybody that, that counts in Washington over the course of the year. And I, and I threw myself into it. I went to all these meetings and, and learned a tremendous amount. And then by fluke, I was hired onto the newly created domestic council at the White House. Uh, the Domestic Council is the counterpart of the National Security Council, and it staffs the president on uh, public policy issues of, of importance to, to the president. Mm-hmm. And uh, it had just been created, and, and uh, it was going to be run by John Ehrlichman, the, formerly the president's counsel. And uh, uh, he took a liking to me and gave me an offer at the end of my fellowship. So I went from the fellowship to the domestic council and I stayed for five years. Uh, and, and I rose to a position called associate director and there were four principal associate directors and mine was called general government. So if you are a little cynical about, about the executive branch, there's four areas they don't farm out state justice treasury and defense Mm -hmm. all the other departments are really grant making agencies or they they help the states with issues you know housing or or education or or that sort of thing but the core government functions state justice treasury and defense that was my purview and and it's the non foreign affairs part of state Uh, they had trouble issuing passports that came across Mm -hmm. my desk uh, the non-economic part of Treasury. Treasury has a lot of law enforcement and uh, 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 currency issues. That was all under my purview. Uh, state, justice, Treasury, uh, defense. Uh, uh, we, I, I wasn't part on the war side, but in my era, the kids were breaking into the armories and, and stealing guns. And, and that mm-hmm. came came to me. And then all the Department of Justice. So, And it wasn't... Wow. It wasn't that I was in charge. I was responsible for being sure what was being done was consistent with the president's desires. And and that usually involved submitting issues in writing for presidential decisions. Now, on the foreign affairs side, that was standard. Nixon wanted a National Security Council that functioned like Eisenhower's which was based on a military model. Mm -hmm. And they had two kinds of writings, uh, uh, national security study memorandum and national security decision memorandum. The study memorandum would be, you know, they're they're running out of uh, gas in uh, Indonesia and we better figure out what we're going to do. Let's look into the problem. And, And they would analyze it. It was always in writing. The decision memorandums were slightly different. The president wanted to know, what's the issue? Why do I have to decide? What are my options? And what do people I respect suggest I do? And you had to be able to write that memo so it was perfectly objective. You couldn't load the memo, you'd get fired. Well, what we did under John Ehrlichman on the domestic side was recreate the same issues. Nixon wanted stuff to come in on paper. He didn't make decisions in the course of a meeting in the cabinet room or the Roosevelt room. Mm -hmm. He wanted to see it on paper, and then there was no doubt what the decision was. Well, I became 
really good at writing those decision papers. Uh, and I could write decision papers about topics I didn't even know about because I knew what he wanted. <clears throat> and he wanted it on, on a page or two yeah. with a bunch of attachments. <clears throat> so he could see what it was, see why it was important. And he frankly didn't care to know what I thought, but he wanted me to objectively present what his advisors thought. It turned out, and this is, uh, uh, I, I think, interesting. Remember, I, I went to Whittier College. Yeah. Nixon went to Whittier College 30 right. years before. And you both grew up in California. Well, we both grew up in California. We were both natives. Years after I left the White House staff, I discovered that he and I had had the same English professor at Whittier, but 30 years apart. When the president went, it was this young, aggressive professor. And when I went, it was this crotchety old man. Hmm. But he taught a course called Basic Communications. Mm -hmm. And the book that he used was called Design for Thinking. And if I turn away from the camera for just a second, happen to have the book right here, wow. Design for Thinking. Uh, and, and what he taught was an analytical approach to communication. And the, hmm. the, the interesting thing about the English language and the inherent ambiguity of, of, of words and how a particular word can shade its meaning depending on how it's used in the sentence. So we were taught better analysis and better communication. Well, I think President Nixon saw in my submissions, what he'd been taught to appreciate 30 years before. But in any event, I got really good. And I, I put in hundreds, I was there five years, hundreds of policy analysis papers. Some were, here's a piece of legislation, yeah. here's what you got to worry about, or, or here's the issue we're doing on pretrial release uh, at the Department of Justice. Uh, and, and I got really good at it. So that, that was one of the things I did on the uh, on the domestic council. We'll get into uh, Watergate just just a little bit later, because I was also at toward the end uh, uh, deputy counsel on this Watergate defense team. But after we left, I've done three things. One. Uh, remember, his administration blew apart. There was an unexpected resignation. Mm -hmm. And the staff was cast out to the four winds, particularly after Jerry Ford lost in 1976. Well, this was before email, before cell phones, uh, before the internet. And you didn't know where anybody ended up. But my secretary uh, uh, had one of these brand new IBM machines that was uh, called a mag card typewriter with a, uh, a, a uh, kind of a two drawer file cabinet next to it with all these paper index cards. And that's where the phrase do not bend, fold, spittle or mutilate because mm -hmm. it could reprint a page with a two word change just right away. And we started keeping the directory of where the people were going who had been doing policy planning, NSC, Domestic Council, OMB, uh, on the president's staff. And to this day, 50 years later, I still keep a directory. It's now done by the Nixon Foundation, mm -hmm. directory of where the people are who were in his administration. We got to missing our friends. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I used to say that the, the, the group, the directory, was mainly the people who didn't go to jail. It was a small group after Watergate. But we started getting together once a year as a reunion for a luncheon. <clears throat> so starting about four years after uh, uh, Nixon left office, uh, I started arranging and hosting annual reunion luncheons. And... Uh, uh, we would always hold them after the November election because these weren't the campaigning people. These were the governing people. And, and your 
viewers may not appreciate the difference, but there's people who are really good at campaigns. Yeah. But that's working on issues and exploiting the base and getting people all riled up to come out and vote. And then there's people who are better at governing. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to govern, you got to compromise mm -hmm. and you settle these red meat issues. And sometimes people that are really good at one of them aren't really good at the other. Mm -hmm. And I only concentrated on the governing side because I'd been in law school during the 68 campaign. So I had nothing ever to do with the campaigns. The domestic council staff was hatched. They couldn't be involved in campaigns. So I'm pretty good at governing and knowing and keeping in touch with people who also govern. Well, we're the only administration that holds regularly scheduled annual reunions. Uh, starting in 2010, we started producing programs for the National Archives that analyzed various public policy initiatives of the Nixon administration. And we would put on a program at the National Archives or on some college campus of people who worked on a particular issue, welfare reform, desegregating the Southern schools, the opening to China. And since 2010, I have arranged and helped to produce 40 Nixon legacy forms. And if your viewers go on the Nixon Foundation website or the National Archives website or my website and look up Nixon legacy forms, they'll find all these programs. And again, we're the only administration to be producing these discussions by the people who worked on the issue. I mean, we're getting scarce as we get, as people start to uh, pass away. Yeah. But the archives loves us because what they say, we make their documents come alive. Huh. You know, you'll be up there and you'll be talking about welfare reform. Well, why did you do it? What, what difference did this particular memo make? What happened after the memo was circulated? And we've got the people on record who did the work. Now, uh, 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 again, the, over time, they're starting to uh, these individuals are starting to fade. But those are the two most important contributions I made from a governance point of view, mm -hmm. holding together, keeping the Nixon people in touch with each other, producing these legacy forms, and my my uh, uh, seminal work on Watergate. Yeah, that's so cool. It's so fascinating that Nixon kind of picked up what he learned and what you also learned in your memos. I mean, I know he kind of took a liking towards you. He he wrote you a letter, a personal letter after um, your work on his defense counsel. But aside from the work that you did in the White House and this little Watergate inconvenience, I mean, wh what is it like to, to be rubbing shoulders with some of the most enigmatic and infamous characters in American history? You're meeting with Nixon. You're rubbing shoulders with someone who I think is fascinating in Kissinger. What's that like? Well, it's uh, it's ego building. <laughs> if if you aren't careful, it can really go to your head. Really, and particularly if you're working on the White House staff. How do you mean? Uh, now we had we had the benefit uh, of Bob Haldeman as chief of staff, and Bob was about the toughest guy you'd ever want to walk wander into. Uh, Nixon had trouble firing people and, and, and uh, uh, giving harsh instruction. Bob mm -hmm. relished it. Uh, I was <laughs> terrified of Bob the whole time we were on the staff. And, and the, my only thought was, I don't want to come to the attention of this man. He's uh, under uh, the radar. Now, I had a great relationship with John Ehrlichman. They had been classmates at UCLA, and that's what made the system work, was... John produced creative ideas on domestic issues, and I was part of that. And it was fun to come to work because you were encouraged to think outside the box. How can we do this better? Mm -hmm. Kissinger's staff on the NSC, they worked round the clock. They, they, they prepared Henry, but Henry was the only guy that met with the president. Mm -hmm. 
Ehrlichman allowed us to sign our own memos. I mean, that's big stuff, but that's very lawyer-like. Lawyers, in John's view, work with each other, not for each other. Uh, uh, and, and it was kind of the same thing with the, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. Well, just to give you a couple of examples. And I remember, I'm 24 years old when yeah, I joined this thing. I was not involved in the campaign. I did not come from a political family. We lived in Orange County. We were we were Republicans, yeah. but I never I never pamphleted or rang doorbells or anything like that. The guy who was the head at the Department of Justice of the Office of Legal Counsel, that's the constitutional division uh, uh, at DOJ, was Bill Rehnquist. And I, I I'm I'm working on creative ideas for legislation and, and uh, uh, law and order issues. I could go over and talk with Bill anytime I wanted. And, and he was such a neat guy because he'd say, well, now, Jeff, you can't do it that way. I, I understand you'd like to, but you could almost get there if you were willing to do it this way. And those are fun conversations. Yeah. And then, of course, he goes on the Supreme Court. Well, his place, once removed, was taken by uh, Nino Scalia. So I'd go over and see Nino, and same thing, wow. you know. And and those yeah. are pretty pretty impressive guys. Uh huh. And then the man who was Deputy Attorney General during Watergate, particularly the end of Watergate, was a guy named Larry Silberman. Larry went on the D.C. Circuit. He passed away recently but he was probably the most preeminent conservative on the D.C. circuit. And he was deputy attorney general during the, the ending of, uh, of Watergate. Now, your viewers may not appreciate this, but the White House and the Department of Justice have to talk. They cannot agree on some point of view or they can, you know, be fighting indirectly in court, but they got to be in touch with each other. Mm-hmm. And Larry Silverman, as Deputy Attorney General, and I spoke almost every day. You know what's going on yeah. here? How do we how do we uh, turn this heat down on this or that? Or why do you have to go out and do this on Friday? Why can't you wait until Saturday? Uh, all the time, and we tease each other uh, that the two of us held the place together toward toward the end of Watergate because it was you know the government was coming yeah. to a stop. Uh, it was it was it was heady times, and then you know, cabinet secretaries, uh, really prominent government people, not on the Hill. I didn't work the Hill, uh, uh-huh. in the executive branch, and and I, I didn't meet with judges. You know, you don't you don't do it that way, yeah. but I sure met with a lot of people who became judges, mm-hmm. and a lot of Nixon's cabinet originally came to Washington through the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, Frank Zarb and Jim Schlesinger and uh, 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 Jim Lynn, uh, all very prominent secretaries of of various departments, but I knew and worked with them when they were at OMB. So let me tell you, it was heady stuff. Yeah, that is so, I can't imagine, I'm 22, I can't imagine as a 24-year-old walking through the halls of the White House, rubbing shoulders. That must have been such a cool experience. And you're right. I mean, that could easily get to your head. So I'm sure you had to constantly remind yourself to be humble. Well, uh, uh, I uh, drove to work. Uh, there's a park between the uh, South Lawn of the White House and the Washington Monument called the Ellipse. And, and uh, if you had a certain sticker on your car, you could park on the Ellipse. And they had a National Park Service guy park, uh, uh, showing you where to park as you went around the circle. And I would get there just before seven o'clock every morning, and I would be far closer to the Washington Monument than to the White House. And then I'd walk from my car to the Southwest Gate and go in between the West Wing and the old EOB. Mm-hmm. And I'd be crossing at a distance the South Lawn and the the balcony that faces south. And I would say almost every morning, you're going to work at the capital of the most powerful nation the world has ever known. 
you know, wow. you better be sure you do a professional job. It was, it was heady stuff, but you didn't go to cocktail parties. You didn't party. You didn't brag. Mm -hmm. uh, if they thought you were doing that, if they thought you were pushing yourself to the front of the line, uh, uh, Bob Haldeman would have your, your pass extracted within two seconds. I, I, yeah. I, I got lost on there for a second. I, I, I told you I was terrified of the man. Remember, I'm six foot six, so I, I find oh, wow. it hard to hide in, in, in groups. He actually turned out to be probably the ideal chief of staff. He had absolute control over who the president saw and what the president read, but he had no personal philosophy of his own. It wasn't, and by the way, he thought basketball players ought to be uh, uh, recruited to work in the Department of Energy. Bob's only thought was being sure the president was properly staffed and had enough information to make the decisions he was required to make and saw a variety of opinions from people he respected. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. very, very hard. But that's what Bob did. Now, he, you know, he, he got caught up in, uh, in Watergate. Uh, John Ehrlichman got caught up in Watergate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I happen to think unfairly. I think they were on the very peripheral of, of issues, but they were the senior guys. And I, I'm reminded of a conversation. Uh, do you remember Webb Hubble? Webb not. was uh, from the law firm, the uh, Rose Law Firm in Little Rock, when Clinton was president. And Webb was going to be associate attorney general, the number three position in the uh, Department of Justice. And he's up for confirmation. And one of the senators says, uh, I understand you're the president's best friend. And Hubble says, well, uh, some people, some people say that, you know. And the guy says, well, I, I think it's only fair to point out that in my experience here in the nation's capital, the president's best friend usually ends up going to jail. <laughs> and he's right. You know, there was uh, uh, Burt Lance under Carter and, and yeah. Webb Hubble ended up going to jail under Clinton. Uh, uh, it's the forces that be in the nation's capital. Uh, uh, there's this note uh, in the bottom of the briefcase that was owned by Vince Foster. He's the one that killed himself on, on uh, the GW Parkway. Uh, he was in the, the, the uh, Clinton White House, and he was handling Bill and Hillary's personal affairs before they got there. Hmm. And he took his own life. And they found in his briefcase down on the bottom a, 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 a note ripped in, in quarters. And it said, this is a town where they ruin people just for sport. And that's true. There's wow. a minuet. Everything seems just wonderful. And you make a misstep and suddenly you're testifying in front of a grand jury. And, and people rapidly rise and rapidly fail. Uh, and and you, you get this distinction. We, we have new words that have become popular, deep state and mm -hmm. false news and fake narrative, and most of all, lawfare. Yep. You know, the misuse yep. of the criminal law to attack your political opponents. Well, that stuff all existed back with Nixon, too. Mm -hmm. And the deep state was a tough nut to crack. When Nixon was elected, 1968, he comes to Washington, January 20th, 1969, he gets sworn in. He was opposed by every institution in the nation's capital, both houses of Congress, virtually all of their staffs, all of the people who had worked on the staffs since 1932, uh, the deep state, which was the protected civil servants, uh, the law firms, the media, the, uh, the lobby firms. Uh, uh, Nixon was a classic outsider, and it's hard for people to remember back, particularly if they weren't alive then, but Californians were considered oddities and strangers, 
Nixon was an outsider. It's not like today where there's the other coast that that uh, is a, is a major player. Nixon was picked by Eisenhower to balance the ticket from from way 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 out west, uh, and and he wasn't charismatic. He wasn't well liked. Uh, uh, he had bumped off Alger Hiss as a congressman back in 1946, 47, and the Eastern liberal establishment never forgave him. They hated him. In his first run for office, 1946, uh, against Jerry Voorhees. Voorhees was a five-term Democrat, and he'd been voted the most popular congressman by the Washington, D.C. media. And here this Quaker from nowhere, serious guy, bumps him off. And then he goes after Alger Hiss and sinks Alger Hiss. Then he runs for Senate against Helen Gahagan Douglas. And she's a what? She's a uh, Hollywood starlet. She calls him Tricky Dicky. And he calls her. So she's pink down to her underwear. And he beat her by 16 points. Well, they just couldn't believe it. And then he gets to be vice president under Eisenhower. Well, remember, Eisenhower's a war hero. Yep. He could have run in either party. Mm -hmm. The political dirty work is done by his vice president, Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. So you could have concluded, if you were a a, a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat, that the problem after 1972 was Dick Nixon himself. That before that, you'd controlled the House since 1932, the Senate since 1932, and the White House, except for this guy, Nixon. So it was really personal. Every bit bit as personal as it is today. Uh, There's great hatred for Trump. There was the same great hatred for Nixon, Mm -hmm. but you added in the Vietnam War, the most unpopular war in our nation's history. Now, there's a group of men, because only men were subject to the draft. It's about 10 years where every decision you made, life, life decision, keyed off the impact of your draft board. Now, I know that because I was in that group. I was in that group, Sub, you know, register for the draft. They're, they're going to get around to you. And and there was the Patriots who said, yes, and you got to go. And the people who said, no, nah, no, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go. You know, and and it, it, it was it was well understood amongst most men. That if you got drafted, you're 18, you got to register, you're subject to the draft. If you got drafted, you were going to Vietnam. When Nixon took the presidency, there were 537,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And if you went to Vietnam, you were going to die because we lost 50,000 Americans over there in that godforsaken place. So the resistance to the government, the, the draft dodgers and the people who went to Canada, Two of my roommates from Whittier College, one went to Canada and never came back, taught at the University of Saskatchewan, and and the other became a conscientious objector. Now, that worked pretty well coming out of Whittier. It was a Quaker school. So you could make the case, you know, while I was there, I, I, I kind of became enamored of the Quakers' views toward peace, so I, I don't want to go to war. Well, on the other side, there were people who were going. They didn't necessarily go to Vietnam, but they were enrolling. Uh, I Whittier didn't allow ROTC on campus. It was a Quaker school. So I get to law school in 1966 from very pleasant, un, unruffled Southern California to Harvard Square, where there's this professor, Timothy Leary, famous for tune in, turn on, and drop out. It was LSD and drugs and fast protest against the uh, the Vietnam War. Well, I didn't want to get drafted out of law school. So I joined Harvard's Army ROTC unit. Hmm. 
And then toward the end, the faculty voted it off campus. But you either joined up for something, Navy, ROTC, Army, Reserves, National Guard, or you were going to be drafted. A little, I'll finish with this in just a second. If you didn't go to college, you got an automatic deferment for, for college if you finished in four years. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't go to college, you were subject to the draft unless you got married. And then for a while, if you were married, they didn't take you, but they ran out of people. So the, the bar got raised and you had to have had a kid. Well, if you're in college and you take a semester off, you're not making satisfactory progress toward your degree. So you're subject to the draft. If you get a D in any course, you're not making satisfactory progress. And there were draft boards. I, I don't know that they were by county, but they were all across the nation. And each draft board had a quota. You're supposed to produce this many warm bodies each month. And by the way, enlistments count against your quota. So you had draft boards in the South where they, they do enroll in the military, where they were never going to be drafted. And you had draft boards in, in New England where they weren't about to, to enlist. And you were really monthly subject to the draft. So there were different standards depending on where you lived. And then we learned afterwards, years later, it was political. There was a guy named General Lewis Hershey who was head of the, C the Selective Service. If you had influence with your congressman, if daddy was given money for a campaign, he could ask the congressman to ask Hershey to exempt you and you wouldn't be drafted. Now, we didn't know that, but I got to tell you, if that were known, uh, there'd be riots in the streets. Yeah. Imagine, oh yeah, Bob there has a rich daddy. He bought his way out. So in any event, all of that came down on Nixon's shoulders and and contributed to the upset and and, and the dislike. It was a it was a heady time. Man, I can't imagine how much pressure he probably had on his shoulders. But I think you you made a great point a little bit ago that even going into his presidential run in '68, Nixon had been long time hated by what you call the Eastern liberal establishment. He was yeah. always seen as an outsider, similar to how Trump today is seen as an outsider. There's so many parallels between those two figures. And